Okay. And welcome to session five, performance monitoring, uh, grid forming projects and pilots. The, we talked a lot during past couple of days uh, about what is the right way of using the grid forming technology on a grid, where to put it, how to operate it. So data that uh, can be available from the um, demonstration or commercial projects uh, using the grid forming uh, resources, whether is it energy storage, wind or solar is, is very important. So availability of, of, of data that shows the, the performance of this, of the systems um, is, is going to be very yes, uh, useful for uh, many uh, segments of stakeholders. Um, also the data available from, uh, uh, from a real systems is very important for model validation. Lots of work is happening on characterizing and testing uh, single uh, grid forming inverter technology. Um, like uh, people who visited NRL um, this week uh, have witnessed the testing and demonstration we do, not necessarily of a single inverter, but a combination of inverters. But the aggregate performance of large scale commercial projects, when you have many of these inverters operating in uh, wind power plants or solar power plants, or for example, 100 megawatt uh, battery storage system uh, is very important. So um, today's session is going to uh, discuss some of these issues, also sharing the uh, experiences from a real field projects, the both on a planning and interconnection process, and also operational. And for that, we have a uh, group of speakers that hopefully uh, will provide some answers to these questions. Um, this session is all virtual. I'm the only real person <laughs> representing it, but that's fine. Uh, the participants are far away and it's fully understandable. And we'd like to thank them for, uh, for some of them. It's either really late or really early hour, but they nevertheless, they are joining this session. So our first speaker is uh, Carmen Cardozo. Uh, she is a research en engineer at RT RTE. She holds an electrical engineering degree from Simon Bolivar University in Venezuela and a master's in energy physics from ENS in Paris, France. Uh, so she received a PhD in electrical engineering in 2016 um, before joining the R&D department of RTE which is the French TSO. And her research topics include the modeling and control of power electronic interface resources and HVDC links for power system stability assessment. Carmen, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, the organization, for having me today. Um, I will be talking today then to, uh, about our Osmos project. So. Um, more specifically, the work package tree, I will give you the details in a minute, um, where I have the pleasure to be the work package leader. And the demonstrator uh, was about demonstrating grid forming capability with a multi service hybrid storage systems. Um, and let's see if this is moving. Yes. So um, the outline of the presentation, uh, it's as follows. So I will start with a brief description of the Osmos project. Then I will uh, go straight forward to the work package tree, as I said. And then I will um, provide a bit of the conclusion first. Uh, I, I will start given what is our definition of grid forming capability that we actually uh, got at the end of the project and the, the way we define uh, these synchronization services that can be provided with by a grid forming unit. And then the most uh, part of the presentation will really focus on the power hardware in the loop factory acceptance test that we perform in, in, in the team facilities. And then I also will be speaking about some EPFL results that uh, they had in their demonstrator. So regarding the Osmos project as a whole, so it's a, a big European project that started in 2018. Uh, it should have uh, had been finished last year by the end of the year, but we have four extra months because of COVID. <laughs> and so we were 33 partners and I will uh, then go in the structure. So we have uh, several different activities to, to gather these partners. 
So um, the the main uh, goals of the Osmos project was like having uh, this holistic view about flexibility. Uh, and so we have some works on, on what are the on more like simulations, future system needs, and how to use this source of flexibility in the different time scales. But uh, at, above all, we have a, a lot of demonstrations uh, and the objective was then to foster the implementation of this innovation by uh, deploying large scale demonstrator uh, lead by transmission system operator. And also then once you have the demonstrator, we work in advanced tool to, to operate these systems. So as I said, we had like a uh, two core package where RT was uh, involved, but um, I will not be speaking today about them on long-term simula simulation scenarios, uh, work package one and two regarding optimal mix of flexibility and market design. And today I will be talking about work package three. So it was led by RTE. And we, we, we have two partners, so EPFL from an India team from Spain. And then just if you want more information for the whole project, please check uh, documentation about work package four, five, and six that are also demonstrator led by other TSO, uh, Red Electrica, Terna, and LS from uh, Slovenia. So uh, let's get into it. So or the work package three specifically talk about grid farming. And the idea was to deploy a utility scale, but let's say demonstrator. So we were uh, more like around one megawatt, so uh, big toy, let's say. Um, but the idea was to have two demonstrators, the, let's say in the right hand, uh, our EPFL side uh, was a pre-existing battery. So we wanted to put ourselves in kind of a retrofit setting. What, how do you proceed if you have already a battery that was not meant to be grid forming, but still have an island mode? Can we operate a grid forming grid connected? And on the other side with the team, we wanted to build a, a grid forming converter on or uh, by the for the project, but by, we have a constraint that was, uh, we only have the right to modify software. So we need to take off the shell uh, equipment that was, uh, and the, the sizing of the equipment was like it was grid following. And then we only do a uh, software uh, modifications to get it a grid forming. That was the objective. Uh, so as I said, in, in EPFL, they have this uh, 720 k uh, kilowatt battery. And on our side, we had, uh, 500 kilowatt uh, 60 minute battery, but also a ultra capacitor. It was a hybrid energy storage uh, for one megawatt 10 seconds. And we put all behind uh, an inverter of one MVA. So yes, the, the, was, uh, the objective to have more power in the DC side than the, the inverter. So to, to optimize the size of the inverter. Uh, and then if I want to summarize uh, all the aspects that we need to work in this project, I'll say that the first part within the team, we need to work in a specification that was like a main a key point for RTE. How can we specify a grid forming converter? Uh, of course, in an r &D project, this was iterative loop. They start designing the control uh, as we progress on the mutual understanding of or <laughs> definition of grid forming. Uh, we adapt the specification, but now we have converge, let's say. And in our case, that was a DC, as I said, hybrid energy storage system. We needed to also work on the DC, DC power sharing strategies. We have one objective in mind that was to make the ultra capacitors do the heavy lifting of the fast transient called by the grid forming function in the AC DC converter and the battery do the energy intensive services. And then of course, I will be focusing a lot in the testing part. So once we have built this converter, how we can do compliance testing to, to check all the specifications that we did. And on the EPFL side, as I said, there was different setting. They have an existing facility, no access to the lower control. Uh, how can we control a, this uh, battery to put it in VF island mode and use it grid connected in a strong grid uh, with uh, real time, uh, really fast uh, outer controllers and do multi-service. Uh, and then uh, performance assessment. Uh, in this case, we wanted in, in when we are in a, in a factory acceptance test, we are in factory, we can make a lot of tests when you are on site grid connected. Uh, you cannot perform the same amount of tests. Uh, so uh, we wanted to work in EPFL, uh, how to do uh, 
monitoring uh, from external measurements, uh, can you say that this unit is doing good grid farming performance? So if I start by the end of the presentation, so what do we conclude? Um, so we provide recommendation for specifying grid farming capability in European grid codes. And we strongly believe that we need to deploy a minimal capacity through connection requirements to avoid a scarcity in operation and ensure system stability. Then we also work in the definition of what are the real the services that a grid farming unit can provide that a grid following cannot. And this, we call it synchronization services. And it's called, it's, it's like put together synchronizing power, system stress, inertia, response, and fault current. And it's important to highlight that they can be decoupled from traditional ancillary services or balancing services. Everything is frequency re related, including primary frequency regulation. Um, this can be done by a grid following, so this is not synchronization services. Uh, we call a grid forming unit that do not perform a frequency regulation, for instance, classical uh, of when he frequency response, for instance, uh, transient grid forming to, to highlight the fact that it's not providing a uh, power for more than one second. Uh, so we, and we show that we can also achieve this at the de device level. So with the CTC controllers, you can make sure that this grid forming service is given provided only by the ultra cap and it's the battery then that is doing like balancing service, for instance. Um, we also achieve experimental validation that we can provide this grid forming capability with off the shell equipment uh, without oversizing while still providing traditional ancillary service and remaining robust to this disturbance. Because in this uh, project for the factory acceptances, we did a lot of fault and harmonic and this um, unbalanced test. Um, so uh, we work also in a compliance testing procedure. And in EPFL size, so they work more in the multi-service optimization framework from the ahead to real time. And they were able to take into account the unit's operational limits, um, show that we can provide any classical service that you provide today with a green following battery, while it is grid forming, there is no impact uh, of one on another service. And finally, uh, we, as I said, they propose some metrics uh, based only on the local PMU measurements. Uh, so no knowing of the internal control variables, for instance, um, and that you can uh, only from external PME measurements already see the superior performance of the grid forming control compared with grid following one regarding very short term frequency dynamics. So um, now uh, what are the, as I said, so this is the contribution and I will start with the first one. Um, what is this? Uh, uh, synchronization services and uh, what do we understand for grid forming. So uh, for us, a grid forming unit shall be capable uh, within its rated power and current. So there is no oversizing beyond uh, nominal current. Uh, be capable of uh, self-synchronized standalone and provide synchronization services. And so for us, it, it means that it should not rely on grid condition to, to, fund, to operate. And then it's synchronization service, depending on the, on, there are many terms that are used, but the idea is that there is an undelayed uh, deployment of this active and reactive power or current uh, for a specific events. And so the, the main function of this, these services are to, to help others units to remain synchronized, um, but it's not to provide frequency regulation. Uh, so we are not uh, requesting overload capacity or uh, capacity reservation with the grid forming capability, neither the provision of ancillary services. Um, so if we put it in a figure, uh, so um, this is synchronized, synchronizing services and that's whatever it's between zero and T1 and T1 can be rather 250 milliseconds, two seconds, depending on the system and when we are starting to define a new ancillary services like fast frequency response or things like that. And the way we put this in our, in our regulatory framework in, in Europe, we have this directive that said, uh, define what are we call non-frequency ancillary services and that today gather already these, these services that we have. Some of them are implies steady state power somehow. Some of them imply just a fast response sustained maybe by some seconds or minutes. And then we have now been talking about this inertial for local grid stability. And what we say is that when we add grid forming, um, sorry, um, we need to add uh, 
uh, new, new services to this part. Uh, it's providing really a fast response and then you can curtail this response in maybe some seconds uh, to let uh, other uh, resources take over. And in this project, so we define this uh, type of grid forming, unit, grid forming units. Uh, basically, um, when we are talking about storage unit, uh, it's a type three because you need to provide a, basically standalone capability, synchronizing power, inertial response, so you can do it easily with a battery. Uh, again, we're not talking here about frequency regulation. And then a synchronous machine is type four. The additional thing is that here you do have a high fault current, not just a nominal fault current. Um, type two, you do not need inertia. And type one is really only like system strain and standalones. And immediate fault current, but still up to rating of the converter. Um, so that's the setup. And then uh, let's uh, talk a bit of testing. So um, this is an old picture now, uh, was July, 2020. Um, so this is the converter that the one NVA converter that we built for the demonstrator in the team built. Uh, so inside you have the, you will see the layout later on. Um, you have uh, an AC DC converter and three DC DC converters. Um, and I don't know, then we have a virtual grid. Um, that is the one that allows to, to simulate faults. Simulate, I mean, the, you apply the fault to the terminal of the converter and you see real fault current. Uh, then to, to fit the DC bus, we have just uh, reduced power a third of the super caps. Uh, so this is so two racks of ultra caps. So we have one rack at each DC converter. Uh, and then we have the battery racks. So the, the, it's like the real setting. So you have the, 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 the DC source uh, connect to the DC DC converters, and then you have your um, grid farming converter. And it's just instead of the, we don't have the transformer, you have the directly the virtual grid that can uh, simulate the uh, fault uh, st uh, steps, uh, phase jump, uh, um, harmonic distortion or imbalance. So we did all these tests. And here, um, so are, are some of the, the same, the, the main results that we had. Uh, to this, the first thing uh, to, regarding the control, we wanted to use a public control. So we use the control, one of the control that were proposed in the migrate project. So the filter group control. And we wanted to, to, to be sure that this is uh, the, the control was known for this project. And the first challenge was that in Migrate, they did not uh, take care of unbalance. And the TVA did not, the TVA, Threshold Virtual Impedon, the strategy that were used for core limitation, uh, did not work properly in the beginning for unbalance fault. And this was an improvement pro proposed by Inge team. And also uh, because the grid codes, we have uh, now this, this kind of droops between the positive and negative sequence. And somehow as we have limited current in a converter, we want to control the share of positive and negative sequence. And we wanted to know if it was feasible to control somehow this share of, of positive and negative sequence, sequence current in a, in a grid forming converter. So that was one of the main contribution, let's say. Uh, so in the team proposed a control that is public, uh, is published uh, on how to, to share uh, the, the, the current uh, share when you have an unbalanced fault. So you rather uh, support the current or the voltage, but at some point you need to choose because you are uh, limited in current. Another thing that we did was working, as I said, in the decoupling of the ancillary service and the grid forming response. So um, we use this, uh, this kind of tuning parameters, transient grid form. It's like a time constant that uh, allows you to go back to the reference power. And, and we use this kind of, of, of um, control setting. And the idea is that if I do a permanent frequency deviation in the grid, uh, if I do inertia, I will have uh, like, uh, I will keep the power on the, on the inverter for a while, but I can choose to track my reference faster. Uh, so the idea was to have like what we call a transient grid forming or a type uh, two grid forming. You just respond to the variation, but then you track your reference fast. Uh, or you can, this is control to, uh, settings, or you can decide to provide more inertia. So let's, let, what means keep the power a bit more longer uh, after a, a, with facing a permanent frequency deviation. 
And as I said, an important thing is that we decouple. We, we see that in any case, the ultra cap is doing the transient. And then there's the battery that is choosing how much time the power is being fed into the grid. And then we have, as I said, um, um, some uh, testing on the different uh, configuration. We could use the demonstrator with the 3D CTC converter, this means as a hybrid energy storage system or as a synchronous condenser like a system. So only with ultra caps or a, like a classic battery a, alone doing grid forming that is also possible. And what we, we showed uh, that we, if you do a phase jump, for instance, uh, you get the exact same response. So you can be grid forming if you are hybrid with a DC DC power sharing strategy, or you are only a ultra cap. So you are only able to do like a synchronous condenser like behavior, or if you are only like the standard solution that is a battery that has become grid forming. And, and this is like, um, as I said, testing the, 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 the facility uh, in, a, in a laboratory, uh, we, we, we see the exact same response. So it's a bit what we wanted to see independently of the DC source, if the AC DC converter is grid forming, uh, it doesn't matter the DC source. Um, so as I was saying, uh, so the, the, this, after the lab, we put this in containers. And the idea was to have in the upper container all the storage systems of the battery and the ultra caps. Then we have a, so each each one is 50, uh, 500 uh, kilowatts. And so two times for the ultra caps to get one megawatt. And then 3D CDC converter, and then the ACDC grid forming converter, transformer, uh, switch gear uh, to connect to the 20 kilovolt bus bar in a 63 kilovolt substation from RTE. Um, unfortunately, we got fire, battery fire, during the site uh, acceptance test, and we never went on live uh, because the, the demonstrator was destroyed. Uh, we could establish that there was nothing to do with grid forming because the, at the moment of the event, the AC-DC converter was uh, not connected to the grid. Uh, it did, ha it did happen on the battery. So we learned about something that we were not expecting learning <laughs> during this demonstrator. Um, so now let's move to EPFL uh, results. So this is again um, on the behalf of EPFL and presenting their work. Uh, on their side, they have this uh, like microgrid in the campus. So they have this experimental battery in a, in a campus that they have PV and it's highly instrumented because they have a lot of PMU, uh, PMUs and they have been a lot of uh, work on that topic. So uh, this is the idea. So they have some PV and they put the, the battery in the multi-services. They track uh, the power uh, schedule in the feeder, for instance. And for what uh, concerns us today, uh, it's how to assess performance of grid forming. So that's what they propose. Um, so they have this uh, local PMU and that was an important learning from the project because before the project they had PMUs on the uh, 50 kilovolts and 20 kilovolts boost bar. And they, when they start to, to try to see what we can analyze, the ratio noise to signal was too high. And actually, it was a trick to use the impedance of the transformer to increase the ratio of information to noise. So we got three months of delay to install the new PMU uh, on the low voltage side of the transformer. And it's this trick that allows us to quantify performance because we use the impedance of the transformer to gain in, in information to noise ratio. And the indicator they came up with was what they call relate, relative rock rate of channel frequency. So air rock off. Uh, so they measure uh, the difference of the frequency and they, they normalize by the power. And there was a lot of work also doing in fine tuning the observation window of this uh, frequency signal. So and we know that 100 milliseconds is a lot because maybe fast frequency response with a specific grid forming, then you can get the same response. And below 60 milliseconds, it's hard to define a frequency. So uh, we did it first in post-processing. If you are in real time, it's different because you get delay on time. In post-processing, you can use an observation window of 60 milliseconds. That's what they did. Um, and they have a high accuracy PMU. So I think the information here reporting re uh, time 20 milliseconds. Um, 
as I said, are normalized by the power. So that's make that the metrics independent of the actual frequency deviation. And this is experimental measurement. That's what they got. They analyzed this, this metric. They observed the cumulative uh, distribution function and uh, for different settings. They do ex experimental uh, running in different settings. And the big thing to notice is red is grid following, of course. Uh, it means that you have uh, your frequencies, local frequencies less stiff. Uh, you have a wider uh, distribution. And they then they have three cases with grid forming. Um, so in one case, they use the signal for uh, 24 hours. Uh, in another case, they use only in the in, in a window, 20 window uh, observation uh, window, sorry, uh, 20 minutes observation window, when you have this uh, deterministic frequency deviation that we have each hour in Europe. So uh, it was a good test. And they did it if you are doing only grid forming or if you're doing multi-service grid forming with frequency regulation, with uh, tracking the, 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 the variation of the PV. And they the conclusion is just in all case, grid forming outperforms, you have a stiffer local frequency. And then they reproduce all these results in a real time simulation that, that has been made open source. They are, they are this, this test, test bench is public. Uh, so they took this IEEE 39 bus system, uh, they put in a real time simulation, they remove generator, put some uh, wind farms, they put the PV, uh, the, the battery system, and they test different controllers, grid forming, grid following. And they did uh, deploy this uh, algorithm of the PMU. And they tried to compute the same thing in this system. And they succeed to find exactly the same kind of distribution. So they reproduce in simulation what we Two see. Two minutes, Carmen. Yes. Uh, um, I think for the reason, um, uh, yes, I don't know what happened with my conclusion slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, well, I, I, I will do it like that. Um, I, I think I started by the conclusion, that's why. Uh, so you have here uh, all the deliverables of the project and the publication from Inja team and my side. And so to, to wrap up this, uh, we, we work so with a manufacturer and an academic. So three, people, three different mindsets to agree between us already what was really forming. Uh, we have a manufacturer that was able to implement it in uh, of the shell equipment, uh, we uh, test it. Uh, it comply with what we specify and the expected performance from a TSO point of view. And then uh, we have like sophisticated methods to try to quantify this performance uh, on EPFS side and make sure that you can do whatever you do with a battery today that is grid following. You can also do it with grid forming while helping the grid. On our side, I mean, for us, it's important to just uh, work in grid codes. And I mean, and there is not consensus, but for us, it's going to be like for connection requirements. And I th we think this is the best way to push deployment. So thank you. Yeah, thanks much, Carmen. Um, our next speaker is uh, Isaac Gutierrez. Uh, Isaac is going to talk about the uh, experience of operating a large grid forming wind power plant in a Scottish power system. Isaac is the lead electrical engineer for grid integration matters in Scottish power renewables in the UK and has over 20 years experience in the renewable energy sector. His main areas of expertise include ensuring grid code compliance of onshore and uh, offshore wind farms. Statcom design review, installation, and site testing. He has been an active member of grid code working groups in the UK. Uh, most recently, his work has focused on enabling a wind farm to operate in grid forming mode and demonstrate the provision of black start services. So he received bachelor's degree in electrical mechanical engineering from the uh, Department of Electrical Engineering at the uh, Technology University of Panama in Panama City in 1996 and master's and PhD degrees from the Department of Mechanical Engineering in Kanazawa University in Japan. Isaac, please go ahead. Thank you much uh, for the invitation to present at the uh, uh, ESIG uh, Greek Forming uh, Workshop. Uh, I work for Scottish Power Renewable in the UK. 
uh, base uh, with headquarters in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, and I would like to present uh, our, uh, our experience of using the forming converter for Icelandic and Blackstar at a wind farm named, uh, named Der Salok Wind Farm. Uh, I work as an electrical, engin electrical engineer for uh, Scottish Power. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to give uh, a brief uh, overview. Uh, uh, I mean, and the, this this project was partially funded uh, and supported by the Scottish government via the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Program. Um, also, uh, we have uh, support and access provided uh, to the transmission network by Scottish Power Energy Networks with the local transmission owner and operator in the vicinity of uh, their saddle wind farm. Uh, first of all, I'm going to run with a, a background of, uh, and the, as I used, the project itself, the test setup, implementation by ourselves, we are the operator, some uh, example results and uh, then comments and conclusions. So uh, what's happening everywhere uh, in the UK is mainly that uh, the amount of renewable generation is increasing and we are losing uh, a lot of uh, conventional and synchronous generators uh, from the uh, connected to the transmission network. So basically we go more converter uh, dominate, converter dominator, uh, uh, generation and the uh, the need for services from wind uh, and other inverter based and converter based uh, generator is uh, the future and will be sold by the you know transmission system operator. Uh, there's a lot of wind farm is a uh, uh, operational site uh, with, uh, with uh, installed capacity of 69 megawatts. Uh, which is uh, in Ayrshire, Scotland, uh, 23 megawatts of three uh, of uh, rated uh, power of three megawatts, uh, which are direct drive turbines uh, uh, manufactured by Siemens Gamesa uh, Renewable Energy. Uh, these are uh, type four wind turbine generator uh, with full converter. So they are fully decoupled from the grid. And this particular wind farm uh, have, uh, uh, sorry, this particular uh, wind turbine, uh, we install uh, external transformers to the wind turbine. So uh, the, the transformer that connect the turbines to the wind farm network is external to the turbine. It's a three point MBA transformer. And, uh, we step down to 0.69 uh, kV. Uh, and, and the wind farm itself go a grid transformer of 90 NBA, uh, which uh, is a step up from 33 kV to 132 kV. Uh, just, just, just to know in, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, the transmission voltages uh, are 132, well, in, mainly in Scotland, 132 kV, 275 kV, and 400 kV. Uh, in England and Wales, uh, 275 kV and 400 kV are considered transmission. Uh, so there's a historical issue there, uh, which I'm not going to go into detail. So the how. Uh, initially, uh, we started uh, a pilot uh, using the concept of virtual synchronous machine under Salo, with, which uh, evolved obviously to what is called grid forming right now. Uh, in three phases, uh, we, we carried this work in three phases, 2019 uh, and then 2020. The phase one, uh, we believe we were the world first wind farm 
to provide an inertia response uh, using, uh, 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 sorry, inertia response to real events in the grid. The phase two uh, included uh, operating the wind farm uh, in, uh, in an island, as an island. And the phase three, which had, uh, was the most ambitious one, uh, well, all of them are, uh, have a degree of uh, a high difficulty to achieve. Though nevertheless, the, the phase three was uh, one of the, and phase four was one of the most demanding, was uh, achieving uh, black, black star of the wind farm cell and then black star of the uh, transmission system from the wind farm. Obviously, using the grid forming uh, algorithm uploaded to the converter. Uh, you know, uh, this project had, uh, we had to prepare for a number of years. Uh, we said we started in 2017, followed by uh, a number of simulations, uh, you know, real time digital simulations as well. Uh, so we could actually, we, we, we tested out uh, hardware that is uh, installed in the turbines prior to going to site and test uh, you know, the capabilities of the grid forming uh, converter. So on phase one, uh, this is one example of a real response for uh, from a grid forming converter, that was phase one. Uh, the, there's an interconnector between uh, uh, Great Britain and France, which is called the IFA interconnector. That uh, is an HBTC interconnector, that interconnector trip on the 31st of May 2019, around 120. So we, we had a setup in the wind farm of uh, an inertia constant of four seconds. And uh, the, the rock off was uh, more or less a, a rock off, which is the rate of change of frequency, uh, was around uh, point hertz per second. The frequency was a 0.5 hertz frequency drop. And the wind farm, the 23 turbines together, more or less, uh, provide an inertia response of uh, 1.2 mil, which is, as you see on the bottom right of the screen, is more or less uh, what the, it's close to what was uh, you could calculate from the, the change of, of power using the inertia. So plot A uh, is showing the, the frequency drop. So B, uh, as I mentioned, we connect, we had meters at, uh, uh, because the wind fan connects at 33 kV, uh, step up to 132, which measure, we calculated the rock off. As you could see, that's more, more or less point, point, uh, 15. And in plot C, you could see the red, the, the red line, is mainly the uh, through the way the, the 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 power that the the wind farm was producing at the time. The blue line was the inertia response. Uh, to achieve uh, one thing, I need to highlight as well to achieve that inertia response. We had to run the turbines curtail, but more or less. Uh, 250 kilowatts because the energy has to come from somewhere to provide the inertia. So there's that video testing. Yeah, we run the, the, the wind turbines curtail. And uh, yeah, this is uh, more or less the, as I mentioned, the and plot D is showing more or less the, the inertia response. Uh, which is more or less 1.2 mil. Next is the, I'm going to show you the test set, setup for phase two, phase three, and phase four 
test. So there is a single line diagram simplify or one line diagram, uh, what to call it, uh, of the wind farm. The, we go a, a main switchboard, uh, which is uh, uh, the voltage there is 33 kilo, uh, kilovolts, and connect three strings. Uh, we would call it string A, string B, and string C uh, of the cement turbines. Uh, we decided, uh, obviously, to provide the, uh, the auxiliary uh, power of the turbines. Uh, during uh, our testing, we uh, decided to select four turbines uh, to, co to connect uh, four diesel generators, uh, which are going to provide basically uh, the you know, auxiliary load during the testing, 125 kVA, more or less. Uh, uh, the reason that we selected those turbines is because of uh, the fiber octer uh, loop, they are the first turbines in the fiber octer loop that comes from the sub substation. So we wanted to minimize, uh, uh, you know, losing signals during uh, trying to uh, create the island or do the blaster. And then in the bottom, uh, you could see what we use as an auxiliary equipment for the whole test. It was a, a load bank, or a, you know, we had a, a, a capacitor and inductance included there, uh, and an everything transformer. Uh, B33 is the main breaker of the wind farm, which connects the wind farm to a 90 MV transformer. And then this 90 MV transformer step up uh, to 132 kV and connects to the transmission system through a six kilometer more uh, overhead line. And then a four, four kilometer uh, on the ground cable up to a substation called uh, New Comnock. Uh, where there is a, in that substation, there is three to 400 MVA transformer. We just energize one, uh, one of the transformer, the 240 MVA transformer. And then they, in that substation, the voltage step up to 275 KB. And there's a synchro check capability at 275. And I also forgot to mention that we also have a uh, uh, synchro check capability at uh, 33 kb. Uh, continue next slide uh, at the project. Uh, the the first part was obviously trying to do uh, after the phase one uh, phase two was uh, creating an island, move from pre connected to island operation, and then synchronize with the grid at 33, 33 KB, as I showed in the single line diagram before. Uh, first, where, you know, we, this is mainly our asset, you know, try to simplify what was on the transmission network. And then in the island one, we obviously try to disconnect uh, First, disconnect from the from the transmission network and then create the island. Or uh, we also did uh, connect it and then open the breaker and uh, turbines uh, working in good forming, uh, stay in the island as well. So, in the black star of the wind from the the we start from the uh, energized state uh, using the uh, board, uh, board ramps and uh, voltage ramps and direct online energization when the, uh, the wind farm uh, the wind farm breaker is open. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, we synchronize with the grid uh, using a, you know, a synchroscope 
uh, 33 kV. So as well, we we try a black star using the, well, we achieve black star uh, with a wind farm plus uh, the grid, uh, the overhead line and the 240. Sorry, and then uh, uh, we achieve first a, a synchronization 132 kV, which is uh, this part here, and then we energize also the overhead overhead line and then uh, we went up for up to the 200, 240 MBA uh, transform, grid transformer so there were a lot of considerations from our part when operating in grid forming uh, we had to be very careful with the protection systems uh, transient, half, transient over voltages harmonics, power source sedation, and everything. Also, there was an analysis of the impact of, of uh, mechanical analysis on how uh, the impact on the wind turbine generator of working in grid forming uh, mode. Uh, yeah, we, we had, we carry out a lot of risk assessment as well to make sure that, uh, you know, we didn't Null energize the network or connect with our air team, uh, the wind farm in island mode. So, in the, when we review the protection of the of the, of the wind farm, the normal protection uh, is, is current base. The wind fan when the wind fan operating um, uh, current control as, as a current uh, source, but uh, we had to review that because uh, obviously the wind fan grid forming are operating as a voltage source, and the main issue that we had was that uh, when the wind fan is disconnected from the grid, obviously this obviously the fault level decrease. Um, we couldn't uh, we couldn't detect where this the simulation showed that uh, because of the uh, fault current contribution uh, from the converter was very small uh, the, 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 the protection of installed the wind could detect the current uh, the, the current base protection so we had to basically uh, use a but the protection scheme, which uh, the only problem with that about the protection scheme is that it doesn't uh, can discriminate. So when there was uh, potentially when there was a fall, uh, the wind farm uh, with the uh, for example, if there was a fall in the string A, uh, the whole of the string A will be disconnected and not an individual turbine and grid A. And stringy, so. So, and again, we perform, uh, you know, energization studies a lot for to check that the uh, wind farm, when operating in island or doing the black star operation, could keep uh, within uh, uh, plant ratings. So, as I mentioned uh, uh, before, there were some challenges and for example the and risks that we had to take the during the island mode for example there was a, 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 a three-phase fall would not be detected uh, so we basically have to run uh, with the risk that uh, a three-phase fall could occur but because most of the infrastructure was underground and protected, we we saw that uh, very unlikely to happen. Uh, again, some uh, uh, on the that's on the middle uh, voltage section at 33 kV in the, in the network the wind farm. At the LV of the uh, the uh, where the uh, 690 volts. 
uh, yeah, again, uh, the three fate faults as well would not be detected. So uh, we have to uh, implement a protection uh, mechanism within the turbine. So uh, the grid forming operation will be stopped if, uh, again, uses, if, again, was using our voltage based reference, uh, voltage based protection, uh, just to make uh, the, the operation of the wind farm would stop. Uh, I mean, the, this is this was also an issue for the transmission operator uh, because uh, under system there will be more uh, less uh, same, the same issue, and then they also implement a similar uh, uh, similar strategy of uh, voltage based protection. Uh, okay, I think it's time to talk about the other results. So, three minutes is out. Okay, I'll be quick with the results. So, for this, we did a resynchronization at 132 kV. Uh, as you can see in the, uh, in the graphic that the breaker that we closed. Uh, and you can see the plot here, for example, the in the top left one, uh, how we were operating. Uh, frequency, the frequency target was 50 hertz, and uh, before uh, you know connecting to the grid, and then you could see that ramp there, where we match the the, the frequency uh, of the transmission network. So uh, we carry out also ramp energization of the, of the grid transformer because that was one of the ways that we study only using for these four uh, turbines. Just uh, one of the ways that we carry out study to demonstrate that we could energize uh, uh, the transformers. As you can see there, uh, this is the, the ramp created. Uh, and you can see the level of harmonics that we detected and also uh, reactive power around the, the power. So for when we carry the direct online energy stations, uh, which we main, mainly was having the whole uh, wind farm as an island, uh, you have hard closing B33. Uh, that was what uh, we uh, measure at 32 kV for the interest of the transformer, this 90 MBA transformer, which was much lower than what we uh, simulated in RTTS. We, we carry out these energy stations, I would say more than 10 times just to demo, to make sure it was not a fluke. And we carry out this energization uh, at different voltage levels, uh, as, uh, for example, at 0.91 per unit, and uh, uh, I think it was 1.05 per unit. So this is the in Russia current envelope for the 240 MPA transformer, which connect uh, the wind farm at 275 kV. So again, we went close in breakers, the B, B33, we closed B132, with all this life. And uh, yeah, we, again, we had uh, an, an interest less than expected uh, during the energization. Uh, that was an interesting result as well. Uh, so, conclusions. Yeah, we, you will need to adapt a system uh, to have Black Star uh, for proper operation and an island model uh, Black Star. Uh, we demonstrated that it's possible to, you know, using smart power source to energy part of the transmission system and synchronize with the external grid. Uh, uh, we believe that the concept of, you know, with power, we not only power island, with the black star is not reasonable, and you know, it could it could be the future when a, in a, a high transmission level with high penetration of uh, of renewables or converter based generation and. But you know, there is still some work um, to be done. Um, also, from the transmission, we will need 
they will need. Uh, they will have certain requirements to operate, operate the grid uh, in a safe way. Uh, so there's some reference, some paper that are in the public domain. Uh, just wanted to show a bit, a quick, uh, uh, that was one of the, oh, well, the synchronization carry out at 33 kV kilovolts. Thank you for listening. And if you go any further questions, feel free to send me an email. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We we reserve all the questions for the for the end of the session, but thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Isaac. So our next speaker <laughs> no is uh, Babak Badrzadeh uh, from Australia. So he's going to talk about the some interconnection and planning experiences for grid for making inverters in Australia. Uh, Babak is currently the uh, technical director for power systems in Oricon. The and also he's an adjunct, adjunct professor with the uh, Monash University, and he's a distinguished lecturer. Uh, with IEEE PES. His focus area is power systems modeling and analysis, including the impact of grid connecting and distributed inverted based resources. Um, uh, some of you may recognize his name since he was the chief editor of Seagrass Green Book on power systems for dynamic, uh, power system dynamic modeling and analysis in evolving networks. So Babak, please go ahead. Thank you, Ahan, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. So hopefully I can finish in 20 minutes so that uh, you will have some opportunity for questions. I'll try my best. So what I'm going to cover for today uh, to share with you some of the uh, uh, potential capabilities uh, from a theoretical standpoint first of uh, grid forming inverters, and then uh, try to look into to corroborate them against the practical performances that we've seen from real experiences, then talking about some of the uh, modeling approaches and challenges uh, when it comes to model grid forming inverters specifically. And uh, that is followed by uh, giving some ideas based on the experiences that we have had on how to account for the uh, performance and response of grid uh, forming inverters, not in today's power system, but as we are looking at to plan the power system and define what are the needs of the power system and what a grid forming inverter needs to deliver, how to basically account for uh, uh, this capability in a power system of five, 10, 20 years from now. And uh, last but not the least, looking at some of the perceived risk, essentially what is the slowing down the pace of development of grid forming uh, inverters. What I'm covering today is based on uh, what we've seen from the response of uh, uh, four grid forming uh, batteries in the Australian power system. While I appreciate that four may not be sufficient, uh, but this is unfortunately a worldwide lack of experiences. Uh, so it may not necessarily be valid for every single instance, but to still serve as a good platform to share some of the experiences. What I'm showing in this slide, and I'm sure in the tutorial, you have been exposed to this at greater detail. I'm not necessarily going to discuss uh, the operating principles of a grid forming inverter, uh, but essentially showing here a suite of uh, potential performance capabilities, and it doesn't necessarily imply that every single grid forming inverter or battery will have all this uh, capability. Focusing on some of these uh, uh, boxes that uh, have been highlighted in green, as you know, uh, a common approach, uh, which we will elaborate further a little bit later, uh, to use the swing equation, and that would uh, provide virtual inertia and what I call a slow virtual damping as opposed to what I call fast, which I'm explaining in a minute. And uh, that is obviously an option. Uh, one can basically decide not to provide uh, either of this capability and instead provide fast frequency response or a combination basically. What I'm focusing more and interested more is the uh, inner loop as opposed to the voltage controller, which is a uh, fast current controller. That's where uh, typically uh, 
especially for those designs that uh, intend to provide additional uh, fault current uh, contribution to ensure that uh, essentially that's been very tightly and as fast as possible controlled so that it does not uh, exceed the limits of semiconducting switching uh, devices. Uh, additional auxiliary loops that uh, as a summing junction, uh, some manufacturers already provide. Uh, one is uh, harmonic cancellation. We've seen that with a couple of uh, actual uh, OEMs that providing this capability. And now I'm coming to what I call the fast virtual impedance as opposed to the slow that I mentioned under this swing equation. Obviously this is the uh, width switching frequency that the PWM uh, is uh, being switched and therefore in order of several kilohertz. <clears throat> With this, you can provide a faster uh, virtual uh, impedance and it has a, a couple of uh, dominant uh, application. One is if you are trying to uh, damp out the uh, uh, electrical oscillations as opposed to electromechanical oscillations where, which could happen because of the interactions of multiple inverter based resources. Also that provide a good opportunity to provide uh, negative sequence current control. All right, so uh, just before in going into uh, talk about grid forming inverters, I just want to set the scene and highlight the uh, similarities and differences between grid forming and grid following inverters. What can we get from a grid following inverters? Uh, there are three areas that I highlighted in green, as you can see here, which they can be equally good, absolutely equally good as a grid forming inverter, which are the uh, frequency support and voltage control and damping of electromechanical oscillation. Again, note the term electromechanical. I'm not necessarily saying electrical because that would be a different matter and uh, we'll cover that uh, uh, later. And the other point, there are a couple of opportunities and in some cases again grid following inverter can be as good as uh, a grid forming and on fault right through we've seen that in some instances could even be better than a grid uh, forming inverter harmonic cancellation also is possible with grid following inverter even though not many oems uh, have produced a practical product but this is not something that requires grid formation just uh, uh, being conscious as to uh, an inverter does not have to be grid forming in order to provide useful grid support uh, opportunity. Grid following inverters can provide uh, quite a few of these uh, capabilities as well. Now, what we've seen from looking at the uh, performance of actual grid forming batteries, those four applications that uh, I mentioned, again, in green, those are that we are very happy and positive, and we can definitely see a trend basically. And the most important and most useful, but, uh, and I want to emphasize on the term useful, uh, is the system strength support. I will have uh, immediately after this slide, a couple of slides that uh, I'd be covering it. Inertia, it's something that has been discussed many times. You have seen it. Uh, I'm not uh, discussing it uh, here, but I will have a couple of caveats that I'm going to uh, shortly share with you. Harmonic cancellation, I already mentioned this to you. So there are uh, some uh, practical products and it would be very important uh, if a grid forming inverter is going to be connected in vicinity of uh, several gigawatt of uh, grid following inverters, which uh, often and almost always a source of uh, harmonic generation. If there is an opportunity to avoid the need for harmonic filter, that would be a very welcome opportunity. Now, looking at a couple of things that may not be as uh, great, uh, one which we are seeing uh, frequently is the conflict between the uh, fast frequency response and inertia provision. And this has happened because uh, grid forming inverters, similar to grid following inverters and any inverter, they are current limited devices. So they can only provide these capabilities uh, to the extent that the current limits of the device permits. And the question comes here, do we always regard in inertia highly or is that because we're just trying to emulate performance of uh, synchronous machine? So that's an uh, open question. We are seeing instances where uh, providing inertia may not be necessarily 
the most uh, required capability. On fault right through, I already mentioned, with, and I'm happy to take these as question. I'm just trying to uh, share these experiences. If there is any further question, we can take this. As I mentioned in the previous slide on fault right through capability, we are seeing that sometimes the performance of uh, a grid uh, forming inverter may not be necessarily as good as a grid following. And this is again, partly and to a large part indeed, related to what I'm putting on this lesson three and the point that I mentioned that again, you have as much as current to play with that is uh, limited by the uh, rating of the semiconducting switching devices. You can provide many capabilities, but you need to prioritize. And if that is not done correctly, it could have uh, uh, unintended implications that, uh, for example, fault track through might be compromised ahead of inertia provision or something else. Now, looking at some of the positives, uh, the system strength support, one of the key problems that we've seen in Australia for past three or four years are the manifestation of low frequency uh, subsynchronous oscillations that uh, typically happen after a fault or after a disturbance, basically. Something that has been presented uh, many times by different uh, people. I'm sure most of the audience are very familiar. So what we've done here for a grid following inverter and grid forming inverter, real products in real power system, uh, we essentially expose uh, both to those oscillations. And what we can see here in the gray uh, chart is that the grid following inverter by itself uh, uh, exhibits uh, this relatively large oscillation. Then we check the grid forming inverter that did uh, not have any of this. It gave us uh, almost like a straight line. Now we have uh, added then the two of them side by side together in the same system, which is a very weak system also that uh, what we are seeing here, not only the grid uh, forming inverter that I already mentioned did not have any of this oscillation, it helps suppressing the oscillations that uh, the grid following inverter would have otherwise experienced. And uh, this has also been uh, presented previously by uh, others in Australia, the likes of AMO or uh, PowerLink Queensland uh, in the samples that uh, they have looked at. Perhaps the advantage we may have here is that we have been able to look at a greater uh, set of samples and therefore uh, again uh, while we cannot generalize this and provide you as you know definite numbers to go and use for your future application uh, we can draw a trend uh, that the first very important conclusion which i will come back to these and how we can use them or should use them perhaps for long-term power system planning applications is that the relative benefit of a grid forming uh, inverter to a synchronous condenser in terms of uh, like for like uh, mva rating comparison is uh, somewhere between one to two meaning that a grid forming inverter uh, if it's uh, properly tuned, would at least uh, perform the same as a synchronous condenser, could uh, behave uh, uh, up to twice better than a synchronous condenser. Uh, if we, And we are only looking at one objective, which is the uh, improvement of uh, system strength. And what we're trying to achieve is to in turn uh, allow further hosting capacity of grid following inverters like some wind or grid following battery or solar or any other uh, source of uh, inverter based uh, generation basically. Now, what uh, we have also seen uh, from these examples that we've looked at is that uh, by this performance, we can achieve a uh, hosting capacity increase of uh, anywhere between two to four times. Just to put it into perspective, uh, that would uh, tell us that if you have a 100 MVA grid forming battery or 100 MVA syncon, you would be able to uh, release hosting capacity of uh, uh, approximately uh, 400 megawatts or MVA, whichever you want to take of grid following uh, uh, inverters basically of any kind, which is a very good uh, success story. And the lesson four that uh, I've already mentioned here, uh, that uh, basically we can achieve the same performance as a synchronous condenser. And one which is probably not been very widely discussed, but uh, to me it's very important, 
Uh, what we have seen, uh, again, from this limited sample is that the provision of additional fault current is not necessarily the reason why a grid following, sorry, grid forming inverter enhances the uh, system strength in the network. I will come back to that uh, as to how we factor in in the short circuit ratio calculation for planning application. But to me, this is a very important uh, you know, distinction, especially providing this additional capability by going to say two per unit or two and a half per unit uh, requires quite uh, significant upscaling of the uh, semiconducting switching devices, which will come at an uh, extra cost. Now, looking at uh, what we are seeing currently and what is the prospect moving forward and uh, people that uh, we are dealing with or what are the interests, uh, whether talking to developers or OEMs or uh, networks, like I said, uh, at this point in time, at least I can say in Australia, and to a large extent is applicable to worldwide, I'm happy again to be corrected. Battery is by far the uh, most used, if not the only basically practical grid forming uh, technology. We're seeing with uh, HVDC and Statcom, and in particular with HVDC, there are already commercial uh, uh, products, obviously, but uh, both lack uh, the additional storage. I understand that uh, manufacturers working on this. So I personally have a good uh, faith in HVDC and probably is a necessity as well to facilitate integration of future uh, offshore wind farms. Interestingly with solar, which is probably not significantly different uh, to battery and to me is easier than wind to implement this capability. No one is talking about it. With wind, again, the key driver is, uh, you know, offshore uh, wind application. But what I can say, what we are seeing and what is being talked about, uh, batteries by far the predominant technology. Now, in terms of looking at various control uh, philosophies of grid forming inverters, and this is basically a uh, common trend or perhaps common mistake in industry that people talking about uh, not new forms of grid forming capabilities such as virtual synchronous machine or virtual synchronous generator. What I wanted to highlight is that these are not new form or not, not superior forms. They are one uh, surely highly uh, common form of implementing uh, grid forming inverters. Uh, but there are other forms and in particular group that uh, at least a couple of major manufacturers uh, are implementing. And uh, the reason I'm highlighting is not to uh, undermine uh, virtual synchronous machine or generator capability by any chance. Uh, but I want to highlight that uh, a grid forming inverter should not necessarily follow and emulate and provide everything that a synchronous generator does. Again, rem uh, remember what we were discussing earlier in this presentation that you have as much current uh, you can play with, you cannot uh, provide everything at the same time. And if so, you're going to uh, provide a little bit of everything rather than just optimizing the uh, capabilities. Now, looking at the uh, modeling, and it's something that I discussed a couple of weeks back in the uh, ESIG uh, EMT modeling, I'm not going to uh, go through in great detail. Again, happy to take any questions. Uh, so what we are seeing with the uh, EMT models, they typically these days, uh, almost always, using the actual real source code uh, that uh, the actual product runs with, and therefore the integration into EMT modeling, it's fairly seamless. Whereas when, when it comes to phasor domain modeling, and this is not a uh, problem with the phasor domain tool, we should be uh, careful here, uh, but it basically requires manual implementation. And the fact that a uh, grid forming battery is neither a, uh, or inverter, let's say inverter, neither a grid following inverter nor a synchronous machine. And the approaches uh, like a you know, Norton equivalent and current injection uh, on how we model these in uh, you know, phasor domain tools does not apply. Surely a lot of great work has been done, especially in North America where most of you are to develop generic models. But in this country, we are talking about uh, user written models that each OEM has to provide. And that is a challenge indeed. I can tell you that uh, unlike EMT models that every manufacturer have and mostly very uh, established and uh, good models, I, we cannot say the same thing on uh, grid forming models uh, when it comes to phasor domain uh, modeling. And 
this is as far as going to say that uh, the availability or accuracy of uh, uh, phasor domain models uh, for grid forming inverters or batteries uh, could be a key project project risk, which I will come back to this on the last slide. Now, looking at uh, another point, uh, when it comes to EMT modeling, we can perform this modeling on single mission infinite bus, because often we cannot access uh, to models of other uh, plants in the network due to confidentiality reason, or sometimes it's possible some uh, parties uh, can essentially perform uh, wide area EMT modeling, the likes of networks uh, and uh, the system operator, which is uh, AMO in this country. Uh, the challenge with uh, single machine infinite bus, what we've seen is that the result could be either very optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, optimistic in a way that does not account for potential adverse interactions and pessimistic that does not uh, account for the positive contribution of uh, nearby devices, for example, to a voltage disturbance or frequency disturbance. And on the other hand, because of confidentialities and sensitivities, uh, sensitivities of these models, there are restrictions as to who can access these models and for what purpose. Now, point that I've mentioned uh, already a couple of times in this presentation is that with grid forming inverters, it's a very flexible platform. You can provide many capabilities, but not all at the same time. So which one should be prioritized? How can we know that? The only way we can understand and uh, formulate that is to perform wide area uh, studies. Uh, and again, this uh, chicken and egg status quo that has been discussed in the uh, ESIC paper published uh, a couple of months ago, uh, that uh, what are the needs of the power system and how to corroborate that against what uh, should be provided or should be prioritized by a grid forming inverter. And uh, this can only be understood and defined by performing uh, this kind of simulation. And I'm seeing that this is also becoming quite uh, uh, increasingly used in the context of North America. The key point I want to uh, highlight from this slide is that if we are talking about all these uh, events and we weren't able to simulate because of lack of uh, detailed model, this is becoming more and more important with grid forming inverters because it can provide many different things, but it has to be defined and it has to be defined in conjunction with the power system and other generators uh, rather than just trying to provide inertia or provide just some capabilities, which might mean that some other capabilities might be dialed down and that may not be to the best interest of the network or the best interest of the generator. Now, moving into uh, some of the longer term implications, because when we talk about five or 10 years from now, uh, we can use the, uh, you know, generic models and that also, you know, being developed in, you know, North America. Uh, but sometimes if we're looking at so long in the future and the system that uh, doesn't exist, it's not just the equipment capability, but the system surely is going to be changed quite significantly and evolve in you know next five to uh, 10 years time. How are we going to plan the system based on some rule of thumb or a screening index? And short circuit ratio is what has been used uh, and maybe is diminishing its application, but it still has some niche applications. Uh, how are we going to account for the performance of uh, grid forming inverters uh, for uh, long-term planning applications. And what we learned from those couple of slides on system strength support is that a grid forming inverter most often outperform uh, the contribution of a synchronous condenser, or we could say uh, even a synchronous generator, basically. We've seen that at the very least perform the same. On the other hand, we know that this is a fact, we cannot uh, disagree with it, that a grid forming inverter provide uh, lower fault current contribution compared to synchronous generator. Yes, you can, opt, uh, you, you can oversize it to provide uh, additional capability, but is that the right way of doing it? Are we uh, trying to achieve extra fault level or are we trying to use that as a uh, metric uh, on how much contribution a grid forming inverter will provide to strengthen the uh, wider power system and nearby inverter based resources. Based on what we've learned and simulation studies, uh, EMT simulation studies that we've carried out. And again, the sample is a small, only four, four samples, but it's worthwhile to share 
with you. Uh, our suggestion is that uh, the if we are going to use fault level or fault current as a proxy for system strength or system stability, then that uh, fault current needs to be multiplied uh, uh, by whatever the factor needs to be in order to make it essentially as a pseudo synchronous machine with uh, that uh, fault current capability, because otherwise this is going to significantly underestimate the contribution of a, a grid uh, forming inverter when it's compared against uh, that of a synchronous machine and when it's uh, corroborated by wide area EMT simulations. Two minutes, Baba. Yeah, that's the very last slide. So uh, what is uh, slowing down the pace of uh, development of uh, uh, grid forming uh, inverters in uh, real applications, large scale applications, hundreds of megawatts, uh, maybe thousands of megawatts, but we are not seeing them often. One of the reasons I'm sure, again, it has been discussed already, I saw and there was uh, a session uh, that it's the lack of uh, tailored performance uh, specification and performance requirement. Because like I said, this is not quite like a synchronous machine, nor should it be perhaps. If it's trying to achieve everything that the synchronous machine does, that's to me a missed opportunity. And it's not quite the same as a grid following inverter either. The other point I made is the lack of simulation models and in particular phasor domain models and concerns from developers on longer uh, connection timeframe, primarily because of combination of the uh, latter uh, two factors that I've already mentioned. And from the network and uh, system operator standpoint is the lack of uh, uh, real field experiences and rightly so. And obviously it's simulation model gives us uh, fantastic responses, but how uh, much we can rely on them before uh, affording to lose the synchronous generators in the power system? How much uh, field experience do we need to gain? And last but not the least, uh, in an era that people you know, keep talking about providing inertia or fault level, uh, one of the reasons that to me hinders the uh, uh, significant uptake of uh, grid forming inverters is that perhaps we might be looking at uh, from wrong angles uh, what else a grid forming inverter can provide that might be more valuable for the power system? And I pause here. Thank you very much. Thank you.